Um, and thanks everyone for coming to the webinar. I'm happy to talk to you today. I'm a, a faculty in computer science at the University of Saskatchewan. And I'd like to start with a video that shows um, one uh, site of the wheat breeding program here at the Crop Development Center in Saskatoon. So we're fortunate here to have really strong collaborators in agricultural and plant sciences and a tremendous data resource uh, from which we can collaborate and, and work on uh, phenotyping and imaging. Okay, so here's the video that I was, uh, I was talking to um, showing one side of the wheat breeding program. Um, and the main idea here is just to show the, the valuable data resource we're fortunate to, to have here. And so based around the strong agricultural science uh, here at Saskatchewan, we've developed a, a phenotyping center that we call PERC, Plant Phenotyping and Imaging Research Center. And uh, PERC is funded from a national grant in Canada called the Canada First Research Excellence Fund. And we're just in transitioning to the second phase of this research center. And we're focusing now on four main uh, projects on crop imaging, uh, analysis of roots and the soil microbiome, uh, a group that um, I lead on using deep learning to do image analysis. Um, and all three of these leading towards trying to develop new technologies and tools uh, for uh, improving plant breeding research. The three main crops that we focus on are wheat, canola, and lentil, three important crops for Western Canada. And I'd like just to highlight that we have um, very ex excellent collaborators in uh, and uh, crop breeding programs in each of these crops. So Curtis Posniak runs the wheat breeding program, Sally Vale at Agriculture Canada in canola breeding, and Kirsten Bett at uh, USASC in lentils and other uh, and bean breeding. Uh, so we're fortunate to have these collaborators and be able to work with them to try to develop new, new computer tools to provide them more information and help accelerate their breeding programs. So the current focus of, of our work at the research center is really image analysis for plant breeding. But there's a, certainly a broader goal of trying to do more computational analysis in the agricultural space in general. And certainly we think the robotics and automation um, focus of the technical group will have impact both in the, this plant breeding, um, develop, delivering sensors and imaging uh, acquisition to the field, but more broadly in, in agriculture. So we're very excited to, to collaborate with this uh, and participate in the group here in IEEE Agra. So in my talk today, I'm gonna to talk about in two parts, I'll talk about some of the image acquisition work we're doing and then some of the work in analysis. So starting with acquisition, uh, the main type of image data that we're collecting at the research center is aerial imaging with uh, UAVs or drones. And the imaging work is led by Steve Shirtliff in plant sciences here. And he has a large team um, that's out there collecting large amounts of imaging data from many of the plant breeding trials and other research trials here at the university. Um, so over the four years, they've been collecting data with a variety of sensors on a variety of different drone platforms, um, primarily high resolution RGB cameras. So Sony cameras, they also fly a 100 megapixel phase one camera, uh, a FLIR uh, temperature uh, thermal camera, and then uh, two different types of uh, multi-spectral uh, cameras, the Microsense Red Edge, as well as the AirFin camera. And these past, this past season, they've been flying also hyperspectral imaging. So as you can see, there's sort of a wealth of data that's being collected that we're uh, fortunate to collaborate with. And although this is a very high-end sort of drone acquisition team, I would say that in general, aerial imaging would, falls under the, the category of low-cost imaging. Because I think with a, with a you know, low-cost imaging setup, um, with a consumer drone and consumer cameras, you can still acquire images that can be useful for plant phenotyping, as well as, uh, gaining insight about crop development that might have applications in, in agriculture or agronomy. So when we fly a drone, the typical uh, workflow is that you fly the drone over the field, take many pictures and then stitch those pictures together into a panoramic image of the field, also called an ortho mosaic. Uh, this is an example of an ortho mosaic, but for a plant breeding uh, imaging, what we're actually interested in, not just a picture of the field, but we need to, uh, we need individual images of research microplots. So you can see here, if I overlay uh, uh, rectangles, uh, these denote all of the individual microplots. 
and those are the, the unit of analysis or or even below you know within these microplots um, so in the context of plant breeding each of these plots has a different genotype and we're trying to estimate phenotypes or traits from those plots so that breeders can compare and contrast uh, different aspects of those different uh, genotypes um, so in order to help with getting these individual um, uh, segmented plots out of an ortho mosaic, we've been developing software to help speed up or, or make that process more efficient. So the piece of software is called Plot Vision. It's a web-based tool, so you can go to a website to upload drone images. So it tries to make it a bit easier to get pictures off of the drone and into an analysis pipeline. Uh, after you've uploaded in the background, an ortho mosaic is generated automatically. Uh, we're using Agisoft uh, Metashape to do this. Uh, but this also reduces some of the manual burden um, because you can upload lots of data and then these ortho mosaics um, kind of appear automatically. And then in order to segment out individual microplots, we have a semi-automatic tool for doing this. So if you have a grid-like uh, arrangement of plots, uh, you click on the four corners of the trial of the field, and then we can overlay the, the geometry of the plots based on the, the layout of the trial. And so then there's some tools to manually adjust these if you want to erode them just to look at the inner portion of the plot or if you need to uh, adjust them if, if, your, if your trial isn't perfectly uh, grid-like. And we're developing some image analysis tools to make this process even more automatic or to refine this process to automatically adjust uh, plot segmentations. Um, but we think this is an important step to really accelerate using drone images in the context of plant breeding uh, where you need to get very quickly to these per plot analyses. In addition to aerial imaging, another uh, aspect, which is even probably closer to the robotics uh, group here is ground-based imaging. And there's a number of groups working on very high-end uh, phenomobiles or different ground-based uh, imaging and sensing systems. And of course, there's many other groups working on robotic systems to have uh, autonomous uh, data collection. At PERC, we have a group led by Scott Noble developing a custom phenomobile. Um, but in our groups, we're actually looking at much more low cost and inexpensive ways to collect ground images. Uh, so these include um, what we call the GrowPro, Protractor, and the PhenoQuad. So these are all different uh, variations of low cost, you know, based, putting consumer cameras either on a stick or a tractor or a vehicle in, in sort of a, an easy way to collect lots of pictures uh, quickly. So the advantages here are that these systems are very inexpensive. They're generally easy to operate. There's no, there's uh, much fewer regulations as compared to operating aerial drones. Since they're inexpensive, they're easy to replicate. So if you have 20 different uh, field trials at different locations around the province or the state, you could um, replicate each of these imaging systems rather than having to try to move the imaging setup uh, between sites. And of course, you know, with these different setups, we find that these have been very easy to adapt to the current uh, setup of the trials. And this is one of the lessons that we learned is that working with, uh, with active plant breeding groups, um, it's uh, until these technologies have been sort of proven to show value back to the breeding program, it's very difficult to ask them to change the way they're operating in order to fit to your imaging requirements. So with these sort of custom setups, it's easier for us to uh, acquire pictures using the, the, the current equipment that the, that's already moving through the fields. Um, and then once we show value that we can actually get useful information from, uh, from imaging data, then that gives us more credibility with those groups to help to work together to adapt uh, the, the layout of the, of the fields themselves. So those are, the, those are the benefits of these cheap systems, but the, on the, the, the drawbacks are that in general, we have inaccurate uh, geolocation information on consumer cameras. Um, there's more substantially more camera motion, uh, particularly with a handheld pole um, than you'd get with a, a purpose-built vehicle. And in general, if we have multiple cameras, we're not synchronizing them. So we really are just letting them, uh, letting them to capture pictures uh, sort of um, uh, quite freely. So we see this as a trade-off in complexity between actually acquiring images and doing the analysis of trying to get useful information out of those pictures. And so we, we think that um, uh, we can get uh, more benefit by moving some of this complexity onto the analysis side. So here's a video showing the Go, the GrowPro in action. So this is a, a, an action camera on a stick that's walked through the field. 
And so this is very easy to operate and really is adaptable to different uh, fields. And this is an example of a, a technician walking through the field, collecting pictures. Um, <clears throat> and the camera is stabilized somewhat with a gimbal on the end of the stick. Uh, but in general, there's still quite a bit of motion as the person uh, walks through the field. The general workflow is to, to try to stitch these, these sequence of images into a panorama, similar to the, the drone images. Uh, but we can get very high resolution pictures because the camera is close to the ground. So you see here, uh, this is for wheat plants, uh, early season cotola plants. Um, but in general, with this approach, the stitching process is a significant challenge. So when you have a, a camera close to the ground, you have many, many pictures to stitch together into even to generate a, a panorama of a small portion of the field. Uh, this is like this is one small range of uh, canola plants. And then the other problem is that you have significant parallax between pictures, which is disruptive to the stitching process. So particularly later in the season when the uh, plants are tall, the stitching really does uh, tend, tend to fail both, both from parallax or, or wind uh, motion, motion of the plants. So instead, this is what we move to a tractor based system where we can collect um, pictures sort of at the same time across the, the length of the plot. Uh, so here's an example with this protractor where we have three cameras on either side of a sprayer boom. And um, as the camera drives, we can collect pictures um, that cover the entire length of the row in this case. And so horizontally here, we can stitch together to get a picture of the row that works fairly well. And then just vertically here, we have to pick out or, or detect each of the individual rows to do analysis. So the row detection, the problem is to pick out individual, individual rows. Um, but then the additional challenge is that we'll see that row multiple times as the camera drives over the, over the plots, over the rows. Uh, so we have to be able to identify individual rows as well. So we've constructed a fairly simple pipeline for, for doing this row-based extraction. Um, we can segment plant from ground quite easily in these early season images um, with uh, simple Otsu thresholding uh, or um, we use excess green as an index to do that thresholding. Um, and then from there to detect individual rows and to detect center lines, we use a clustering based approach. Um, but instead of using standard k-means clustering, we treat, we, we sort of know that we have this striated data, this sort of these clusters in rows or lines. So we consider cluster centers as lines and then fit those clusters to, uh, to those lines. So we'd start with sort of um, an initial guess and then run a, a sort of k-means clustering algorithm but where cluster centers are lines um, in order to fit these. So we think this is actually a pretty general approach. We call it k-lines clustering uh, for many agricultural fields where we have row-based data. Um, but in this case, it works quite, quite effectively for cropping out individual rows. And then to detect unique rows, we can do pairwise registration. So rather than switching all of the images together, we can just do an approximate overlap of picture to picture to detect when we see a, a unique row. So here, every time you see a blue, a blue and red overlap, we know those belong to the same uh, row. And so from this, we can crop out individual rows, all of the pictures of each row uh, from a trial. And so here you can see in these, you'll see these pictures jiggling slightly, and that's because we have five or six pictures of each row as the camera drive, as the tractor drives over it, so they're slightly different uh, viewpoints. And so the workflow for doing this row cropping is all is open source, and you can check it out on, on GitHub. In addition to doing analysis, uh, we also think it's important to be able to provide the pictures back to plant bridges as well. So we've developed um, another web tool for inspecting the row-based images. So this, uh, in this uh, visualization, you can see an overview of the whole range uh, along the top, and then in the middle, um, a picture of the whole row, and then a zoomed-in picture below. So this, we think, is useful for inspecting crops. And then you can just cycle through the images uh, over the season to see how each individual plot uh, progresses. Great, so that's uh, the, uh, the break in acquisition. So I think we'll stop and ask questions about uh, acquisition now. Okay, very good. So we already have one question uh, it's from Valerio. Is Do you have any idea how you will separate weeds from the crop? Is that part of this project or, or not? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so in the context of these plant 
breeding trials, we actually have very well managed uh, managed trials. So, uh, in in general, we we don't have to. You know, the weeds are sort of removed by the management of the trial. People go out and weed the trials. Certainly, in the context of more general agriculture, you know, detecting weeds versus plants is important for many applications. Um, the row detection, I think, is useful because you know, um, in in almost any agricultural context. Uh, crop, plants are seeded in rows, and so in general, you know, weeds. Anything that's not within a row is is, is definitely a weed. Um, but of course, separating weeds that are close to the rows is more challenging. Um, so we're not really addressing that. But yeah, I think it's a it's an active area of research for weed detection in many groups. Okay, very good. Um, so the next one is from Larry on Protractor. Are you taking a movie or you? Um, and how many frames per second? Or are you taking like um, um, yeah. something slower than that? Or yeah, what spec spec specifications on that? Yeah, that's a good question. And certainly um, in all of these imaging, both drone or tractor imaging, the sort of trade-off between acquisition speed, ground resolution, and, and vehicle speed is important. Uh, so with the protractor in particular, uh, we're using actual GoPro cameras and in time-lapse photo mode. So they can acquire pictures at uh, two Hertz. So two pictures a second. And those, those videos you show that that's, those are playing in real time. So that's, the, that's what you get, you know, the tractor drives reasonably, um, reasonably slow, but uh, we can cover a large trial in, you know, about an hour of a vehicle drive. Okay, this is a follow up from me. So how large of a car do you need? Like how many gigs per GoPro do you need to run yeah. for an hour? Or do you trade out cards or how does that work logistically? Just logistically. So we will, I think we run 128 gigabyte SD cards. And so we'll, wow. we'll acquire images all day and then dump them at the end of the day. And so we have sort of a, a, a fairly, fairly fast way to try to get all those pictures off in parallel and get them through the row cropping pipeline um, at the end of every day. That's generally the, 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 the plan. Okay. Um, all right, you guys are, everyone in the audience is doing a wonderful job on getting questions. Okay, so uh, this one from Matt is, um, thanks for posting your project on GitHub. For your ground imaging protractor, what type of camera are you using? And is there a paper or documentation on your setup? Yeah, so the, in that, there's a protractor paper that we just um, showed at the CVPPP workshop uh, at CVPR. So that, that has some of the details about the, the construction of the, the tractor itself. Um, it was built by Agriculture Canada. So it's a collaboration between our group and um, the group at Agri-Food and Agriculture Canada. We use uh, GoPro cameras. So it's pretty, really pretty easy setup. It's a, um, a repurposed sprayer boom. Um, um, but yeah, you can check, check out the papers for details. And if you have other questions, certainly email me. It's also easy. Okay, and I can send him the, um, the link from the webpage too. Um, so uh, this is Rocky Bull says, thanks for the great presentation so far. I want to know, have you faced any reflection or shading problems while taking the images? Yeah, so certainly uh, lots of both of those. Um, there are groups that construct large uh, kind of canopies to shade the area of which they're taking pictures. And um, in, in general, uh, we haven't gone that direction. You know, there's just some mechanical issues um, to do that. but. Uh, in the analysis side, as I'll talk about, um, we're, we're trying to collect large data sets so that we can be able to um, extract information despite that large variation we have in uh, reflections or lighting conditions. So, so in general, we've tried to make very, very low cost uh, acquisition and then try to make up for that with some um, machine learning approaches on the analysis side. Okay. Um... And I'm going to, okay, so all, we have quite a few questions. So um, the questions that we have, I'm going to ask, and then um, then we're going to move on to the second half of the webinar. This is for the audience. Um, and so this is uh, a follow-up on this, on the um, conditions. Does the weather condition matter when you acquire images? 
Yeah, certainly the, the biggest challenge we face in Saskatchewan is, um, is wind. So for, uh, for drone imaging, there's sort of a certain um, wind speed that makes it hard to fly drones. But usually throughout the season, we'll have, you know, at least two or three days per week where they can fly drones and acquire pictures. Uh, for the ground-based uh, tractor system, it's, uh, we can operate in windy conditions, albeit with more plant motion, particularly when things are uh, taller. Um, and then uh, it, the, the challenge there is wet conditions. So if the soil is too wet, then um, it can be, we can't drive the tractor, which is sort of typical for, for field maintenance. Um, but, you know, in, in general, we can, we, we can do sort of a weekly imaging of all the trials, either with the tractor-based system or the drone-based system. But that's generally what we, what we shoot for. Okay. And then um, from Andres, if, if you're using a RGB camera for the greenness indices, do you calibrate the images? And if you, if you do, how do you calibrate them? Yeah, so certainly all of the aerial drone images, there's a, a full calibration uh, procedure that's, that's gone through where they, there's a sort of calibration for the location of the images with ground control points. And then the actual spectral uh, calibration is done with a gray panel. Um, so there's a sort of standard workflow for doing that kind of calibration. With the tractor images, um, we, we do uh, use gray panels, uh, but since we're using cheaper cameras, uh, GoPro cameras, we, we generally have more variation. Um, but we found that even despite that variation you get in color, you know, uh, at least for early season where you have um, before canopy closure, segmenting plants from soil is quite easy, even in, in um, fields that have a lot of crop residue or, or that ha have not been um, uh, tilled. Uh, but cer certainly calibration can be important, particularly depending on the questions you're trying to answer from the, from the pictures. Okay. Um, and then how much image data are you generating per actor, per acre or hectare? Oh, that's, that's hard, uh, <laughs> hard to answer. Um, you know, in, in general, we're in the, like, I would say hundreds of terabytes of data. Wow. Okay. Uh, um, you know, per season, uh, certainly the, the, the data, the, that's, you know, the raw data is one thing, but then once you start processing aerial images into ortho mosaics, uh, you can think the data rates kind of go up substantially. Um, but yeah, certainly it's a lot of pictures. And then the, the tractor based systems, so we have six cameras uh, uh, capturing in parallel, it generates uh, substantial amounts of pictures. Yeah. Luckily, luckily the storage is, is quite inexpensive, so we don't, we don't concern ourselves too much about storing raw data um, at the moment. Okay, and you said for the tractor-based system, it was 128 gigs times six per day if you ran it all day, right? Something like that. Uh, something like that. It's probably we probably don't fill up the cards every day. Every uh, day, right? Okay. Uh, you know, it depends on the uh, on how much we're we're capturing. Yeah. Okay, uh, and then there's one about what's the maximum speed. Um, yeah. Again, good question. Um, I, I, I don't know off the top of my head exactly what speed they run. The, the, tractor, the tractor we use is, is not GPS steered, so there's a person on there steering, but they can um, run in like cruise control, so they have a constant velocity. I don't know exactly the speed, but it's, it's you know, reasonably leisurely paced, I would say. You know, I guess we're, you can see how fast those pictures are rolling, and we're taking two per second, so um, uh, it's reasonably slow for sure. Yeah. Okay. And this is the last question uh, I'll ask this time, but if you have questions, just keep on writing them in and then we'll get them at the end. Um, when do you think this technology will be able to detect, will be able to detect morphological differences within the crop? Yeah, so I think a lot of the work we're doing on the analysis side is trying to do that, um, you know, within a single species, trying to detect small differences in morphology. Um, and they're usually related to plant breeding questions or things that the plant breeders are, are, are already rating. Um, so in the second half, I'll talk a lot about counting plants, uh, but we're also trying to do things like estimate uh, early vigor, you know, both just the kind of can canopy or ground cover, but also morphological changes that might be related to more vigorous or less vigorous plants. Um, 
so that's one of the reasons that we're focusing on fairly high resolution images is that we, we think that there's a lot, um, a lot of information just in the morphology itself, the spatial that we can get from spatial resolution. Uh, certainly there are other questions that can be asked with spectral resolution that are related more to physiological changes in, in plants and crops. Um, but a lot of the questions we're trying to, a lot of the information we're trying to provide to the breeders seems to be connected a lot to um, things we can get from morphology. Okay. Very good. So I'll mute myself and um, look forward to the next half. Okay, great. Thanks. Uh, so on the analysis side, we, we're really trying to extract phenotypes from these images that I, I've, I've been showing. And so a phenotype really is a, a physical characteristic or trait of a plant. And there are a number of phenotypes that are uh, relatively easy to uh, estimate from images. And these are linear functions of the plant pixels in an image. So things like shoot area, NDVI, canopy temperature. And these are relatively easy to extract from an image and they actually can be uh, relatively powerful or like, useful in terms, of, um, in terms of selecting for different varieties. So even though these are easy, they still are generally useful. There's other phenotypes that are a little bit harder. Uh, they're nonlinear functions of plant pixels, but they're still, they kind of have, um, a geometric nature based on um, the plant pixels. So basically you can do geometric statistics on your segmented plant pixels and get things like height or convex hull, center of mass. Um, so all, all of these general phenotypes we think are, uh, can be well addressed by sort of traditional image processing pipelines. And so for these sort of things, we do use traditional image processing. We like uh, plant CV in particular out of the Danforth Center, but there are other, um, other image processing plat uh, platforms and software for doing these things. Um, uh, for, for roots as well, there's a number of different pieces of software for doing roots, um, in particular out of uh, the University of Nottingham. There's another sort of section of, of harder phenotypes that are both nonlinear functions of plant pixels and non-geometric descriptions of plant pixels. And these are things like uh, organ counting, you know, the number of organs on a plant, um, the response to stresses, either biotic or abiotic, the maturity of the plant, growth rate, and then, and then um, cumulative phenotypes like biomass or yield. And for these types of more challenging phenotypes, we think that some of the machine learning approaches that are emerging are probably a better fit. And then we also see a contrast between indoor images uh, like these that are set up uh, pictures from a Lemnitec system or similar where you have a photo booth for your plant and a pot. You know, those are sort of set up to make the image analysis easier to do. And so traditional image processing probably likes, makes a lot of sense. But for outdoor imaging, field imaging, um, the, there's so many, so many more sources of variability. Um, you have much more uh, cluttered backgrounds, very close uh, growing plants that occlude each other, uh, variable lighting conditions, uh, wind motion of the plant. So all of this variability we think means that uh, deep learning approaches, again, are more a better fit here. Uh, so trying to learn the features that are most appropriate uh, given uh, and try, trying to manage the amount of variability you have in data sets. So in deep learning, uh, we've been developing a piece of software called Deep Plant Phenomics, which is also open source. And the idea here is try to provide some of these deep learning approaches in a bit of an easier platform for uh, plant scientists and plant breeders. Uh, so it has some uh, basic pre-trained models for doing certain uh, tasks. Uh, uh, feed and sapping tasks, as well as some uh, built-in loaders for some of the data sets that exist already. Um, so again, we're, we're uh, uh, happy to collaborate and you know, interested in feedback on the platform. Uh, our first foray into phenotyping was with rosette, uh, rosettes and images of rosettes. And this is mainly because when we started, the, really the only public data set that had both images of plants and corresponding phenotypic labels was this uh, rosette data set uh, published by the International Plant Phenotyping Network um, in, in this paper in uh, Pattern Recognition Letters. And this is the data set on which there's a, a competition that's run by the IPPN for both plant counting and plant uh, leaf counting and leaf segmentation. Um, for this initial work, we used the full data set that's published in that paper. And we were trying to estimate all three of the labels that are, that in, are included in that data set. So the number of uh, counts, uh, the number of leaves per plant, 
the mature yield of plant. And then for Arabidopsis, there was five mutants. So trying to classify the mutants of Arabidopsis. And this initial uh, paper was really just to show that these deep learning approaches with convolutional neural networks uh, work well in the context of these data, plant phenotyping data, even with small data sets, because the, the Rosette data set is still quite small. So we could count leaves with very low error, uh, estimate maturity quite well, and then classify the different mutants of Arabidopsis very, very well as well. And this was also sort of trying to put together this platform uh, for deep learning in plant phenomics. One of the challenges we have in general with plant phenotyping is that data sets are very small and uh, the variation inside of those data sets, uh, images of plants is also very, very, very small. So unlike large imaging data sets that you have for general computer vision tasks uh, like ImageNet or uh, Coco or all the other various mainstream imaging data sets, all the plant data sets are going to be um, really tiny in comparison. Um, and so an important aspect of doing deep learning for these data sets is to have uh, reasonably small or sure, appropriately uh, structured and sized networks so that you try to reduce overfitting. And then also trying to augment these data sets to provide more variation in training. Um, <clears throat> so this is an example from the IPPN data set where there's four main um, sort of subdirectories of plant images. And they all have very different um, distributions of plant counts. Uh, so it can be hard to generalize between these data sets. And so one of the data augmentation strategies we tried to employ was using synthetic models of plants and using those as, as, um, as data augmentation. So this was in collaboration with a group at the University of Calgary that has L system based plant models. So an Arabidopsis model that, that, that grows and is uh, parameterized. And then we can vary the parameters of those models to create synthetic imaging data sets that can kind of fill in the gaps of the variation we don't see in the real data set. This was done in the context of plant counting. So the models actually could be quite, quite simple in this case. Really, we're looking just at the structure of the plant and the location of the leaves in space. And so this is an example on the top of images from real images from the data set, and then examples of, of fake or, or a synthetic data set generated from models. And we found that uh, adding these data sets for the problem of plant counting helps to uh, improve the generalization and improve the performance um, of the models uh, uh, to a certain degree. So we think that this, these sort of synthetic imaging data sets are a potentially important direction. But we really wanted to move toward field imaging. This is the, the majority of the imaging and the, the thrust of the work here at the Phenotyping Center. So we've looked at a few different studies of trying to count plants and plant organs. Uh, from field images. So this first study is looking at early season canola images, uh, brassicas, from the protractor. And you can see here the sort of the stage at which we're trying to count plants. So at the very early stage, you know, individual plants are quite easy to detect. But the main challenge is on the bottom right here, um, uh, instances where you have dense, dense plants that overlap, then it becomes very difficult to to identify individual plants. Um, and in particular for wheat and canola, the, the air seeders that are used um, don't evenly space, don't evenly space out seeds. So you generally have this clumping phenomenon where you're, you'll inevitably have this sort of variation that makes this plant counting uh, challenging. Uh, in contrast to, to corn or soybean where you have evenly spaced seeds and, and less variation. Uh, in this case, we have to deal with this, this uh, slightly more challenging situation. Um, so in this, in this study, we looked at counting by detection. So using um, an object detection network to try to detect in individual plants uh, by drawing bounding boxes around them. So this is an example of the training set that we would have manually um, annotated. We did an inter-rater um, evaluation and found that for individual or isolated plants, the inter-rater group was very good. But in these clumped plants where you had overlapping leaves, there was more variation. So it just shows again that this is more a challenging situation. And here's some results. The green uh, boxes are the, the, the manual annotations and the red ones are the predicted. And so on the top for isolated plants, it works almost perfectly. Um, but for the clumped pictures, the bottom set, um, it's, it, there's certainly more, more challenges or, or uh, mis, misdetections um, in that case. 
But overall, uh, with this object detection approach using a standard uh, faster RCNN implementation, we got reasonably uh, good um, MAP and then a slightly better counting performance than just using linear regression of plant pixels. We're still working on this project and trying to um, compare to ground-based counts. So part of the phenotyping center, we have lots of ground truth um, labels that were actually uh, measured in the field. So people that went through and physically counted plants along the rows of those canola trials. Uh, so this is ongoing work working with the breeders to try to really prove that this counting can be as accurate as um, the tedious process of counting in the field. Uh, we've also done counting uh, with regression-based networks, and this is in the context of wheat plants, um, which are arguably, you know, have more challenges because the leaves are very thin, uh, coupled with this overlapping phenomena of having plants clustered close together. Uh, so this data set was generated with the GoPro, the manual uh, walking the camera through the field. And so from uh, overall images of a yield plot, we uh, did a, a segmentation network to get patches of connected plants. Um, and then the labels that go into the regression network are just the scalar count per patch. Uh, so for example, for this image of wheat plants, the, the label for this is, is just uh, the scalar eight because we uh, estimate there's eight plants there. And these were estimated from the images. So we asked the plant scientists that did this labeling for us what they were doing when they were trying to do this just to get some intuition. Um, oh, let's compare this. So this is just to compare to plant counting, the, the rosette counting, leaf counting task, we think is comparatively uh, slightly easier. Uh, so these are like 11 leaves in that rosette compared to eight plants above in the wheat picture. Uh, but when we asked the plant scientists what they did to label these, they said that they looked for the base of wheat plants. Um, and those are denoted here by the yellow arrows. And then they said, in addition, when they found very dense clusters of leaves, they knew at this stage of growth, there shouldn't be that many leaves. So they would say every of these, in these dense areas, they would say there's probably another plant um, underneath this that's occluded. So they would sort of estimate some additional plants. So this is how they would come up with eight plants in that picture. But the actual label that goes into the, to the network is just the scale account. So we don't have any of these arrows or the localization information. So this is the overview of the pipeline. So from the, the raw GoPro images, we do a segmentation to, uh, through a segmentation network to calculate these connected patches of wheat plants. Each patch then it's passed through the counting regression network and then we sum up all of the counts per patch to get the final count for the full yield plot. And the results we looked at both were on the segmentation side and the plant counting network. So for segmentation, we're getting kind of a rough segmentation of the plants. And the important thing was to try to include all of the plant pixels. So they were sort of naturally a bit uh, larger or a bit more conservative of segmentations. And so the, um, the accuracy is a little bit a little bit lower, but we think it's acceptable in order to get basically to get connected patches of plant pixels. And then on the counting problem, we compared to sort of the previous results, our previous results for leaf counting, and so we could get slightly better performance on the plant counting task than the leaf counting task. And we evaluated a few different architectural choices for doing so. Um, and we we uh, required a slightly more complicated model um, than was used for just leaf counting in previous work. And to, get, to try to get a better sense of what was being learned in this regression-based model, since we don't provide it any localization information, we looked at saliency maps from the learned features. And so this is one approach to try to get some intuition as to what the important regions of the images that are being picked up on by the network. Um, so in this example, you can see two, two different examples that are fed through the network, and then the heat map shows sort of the, the hot areas, the areas that look to be most important or most salient. And so the top image, actually the base of the wheat plants is along the top border of the image. And on the bottom example, the, it's flipped. So the uh, base of the plants is along the bottom edge. And so when you see the overlapped images that generally it seems like the network is picking up on the regions of the images at the base of the plants. And then also some regions where there's dense uh, overlapping uh, plant pixels. So it seemed to, to roughly match with the intuition that we had from how the plant scientists themselves were counting uh, images. 
We've also looked at trying to do um, some organ counting. So in wheat, uh, the wheat heads are an important phenotype um, that we'd like to try to estimate from images. And again, this is very challenging because they're very densely planted plants. And so you have lots of overlapping wheat heads and lots of occlusion and occluded backgrounds, which is uh, challenging. These pictures were captured with the phenoquad. So again, a close up uh, inexpensive approach. But the challenge with these uh, really dense uh, plant organs is that you have a very high resolution picture of the yield trial. And the general approach to trying to push these images through a neural network would be to uh, crop up small patches um, and train on those smaller sized patches. But one of the challenges of, if you do a tiled patch like this is that inevitably you're gonna cut off some object instances. Um, so at training time, maybe that amount of label noise is acceptable, but if you're really trying to count the total number of wheat heads in this, in this uh, yield trial and do this tiled approach at test time, this might lead to sig significant error we would, we would sort of expect. Um, so in this approach, we're using uh, sort of typical density-based um, counting approach. Um, so CNN, in, in this case, we're using um, like a, a, a global sum operation at the end of the feature maps. So the general idea is that this model is trained to learn a density of um, a density map of, of the object instances. And then in this final feature vector, we, the activations of this, of this, uh, of these vector scale with the number of object instances. So if we pass different sized images through this network, you can see the activations here sort of linearly scale with the number of object instances. Um, and the sort of important aspect of being able to pass different sized images through this network is that there's no fully connected uh, layers here. This is sort of fully convolutional um, network. So we could pass small size patches as well as uh, larger sized images through the same network. And so what this allows us to do is at training time, we can train on these small sized uh, images, patch wise uh, training. But then when we go to infer or test, we can use the full size images through the same network to count the total number of, of instances in the, in the overall picture. So we avoid that problem of cutting off object instances um, at test time. And um, the preliminary counting results, this is an example with saliency maps. So this is showing, um, uh, the middle images is training on full-sized images and basically we get no localization performance. Um, but when we train on patches and test on the full-size images, this is the rightmost images. These are one, 128 sized patches. And even though the individual patches just have a scalar count associated with them, the, the network still does learn to sort of localize uh, regions of the images that it contained wheat heads. Um, and we are able to get some baseline uh, metrics on this for recounting. Uh, we're still working on this project with with larger data sets and images taken at different different angles to try to improve those counting results. Great, so to summarize uh, in our group here, we're working on different ways to acquire images and try to extract the per plot or per row information that's critical for uh, getting phenotypic information in plant breeding. We're generally applying convolutional neural network approaches to do plant detection and counting and segmentation. And then we're also developing some tools to help visualize the outputs, uh, both the, the phenotypic outputs, but also the original images themselves so that uh, plant breeders and plant scientists can go back and look at plant images when they see something interesting in the data. Uh, our group is very open to collaboration. Um, so we appreciate that all of these problems are very hard and in particular, Having data sets that span very different environments and different growing conditions is critical to making progress. So uh, that's why we, we try, we're trying to be as open as possible with both our software uh, that we're developing and collaborating with other groups. And so with that, I'll thank everyone for their, for their uh, attendance. All right, great. So I'll grab some of the questions. Um, that I didn't get last time some of the new questions. And if you have questions, go ahead and write them in. Okay, so this is one from Brandon. Are you finding that you need high resolution images to get the answers you need? Yes, certainly for these questions of so really trying to, to count, you know, to get uh, stand counts or germination rates, 
we think that having close-up pictures is is uh, is important. Um, there are other other questions that just relate to sort of the the, uh, the health of the plot, you know, where maybe NDVI, lower res NDVI kind of average things can work. But we think that um, for these detailed uh, counting tasks, that resolution is important. And, and some of these, some of the setups, you're using a camera that's pretty far away, but you're also capturing um, objects that are very small. So it depends. Yeah. Um, there's another question about, oh, maybe I'll find it. Um, okay. Oh yeah, here it is. Do you image closer to the plants early on? And if so, how does this affect image analysis? That was the image yeah. distance question. Yeah, so we, uh, with the tractor system, um, the sprayer boom uh, kind of moves vertically along rails. So we, we try to be sort of consistently, the, a consistent distance away from the, the top of the canopy. Um, but that's just sort of pr uh, pragmatic because we want to try to capture images that span the entire row of plants. Um, with a, the UAV, the aerial imaging, with the very high res uh, phase one camera, I think we can get uh, ground resolution sort of close or similar to what we can get from the tractor. Um, but certainly there's a, always a trade-off between uh, ground resolution, sort of the size and cost of your camera, and the speed at which you can fly the, the drone. So, um, yeah. Okay. Um, you talked a little bit about the control patterns. Uh, this question is about, um, do you use control plots to calibrate as well? Yeah, that's a good point. Um, so uh, we think that one of the, one uh, important uh, valuable aspect of doing imaging is that we can try to get a better get a handle on within field variation. Uh, so traditionally, this is done by having guards or check uh, uh, plots within the trial. So we certainly have those. Uh, the, these these trials are sort of set up in that that direction. So. We're working on ways to try to account for spatial variation um, by bringing in information about that spatial variation, but also using those those check plots as as ways to kind of calibrate uh, throughout the field. So, but that, that's a, a good a good point and a good question. Okay, um, this one is: Do you think this technology can be used to successfully eliminate the pest problems faced by farmers? and find a correlation between the pest infection and the morphology of the plant. Um, yeah, I think, you know, in general, that's one of the phenotypes that's, that's important, um, both uh, in terms of finding sort of um, ge uh, varieties of these crops uh, that are, are resistant to biotic stress, um, and then for management, trying to early detection of uh, insect uh, um, infestations. You know, right now that really hasn't been the focus of our work. We're working, you know, but uh, like there's other groups that are looking at detecting pests or um, abiotic and biotic stresses. And I, I think that's a, a definitely a good direction for imaging because hopefully we can um, see things faster or be able to um, be able to image at a at a rate that's higher than you might be able to visit all of the trials um, manually. So maybe we'll pick up some of those things faster. Okay, um, and okay. Uh, do you think it is possible to achieve the same degree of resolution using a drone equipped with an RGB camera? Uh, oh, yeah, so sorry, I, I missed a word. Um, sometimes I'm reading a couple things at once. Um, even using a drone equipped with an RGB camera, I think as compared to the ground system. Yeah. Yeah, so in our, our, our UAV group, um, they're, they're, flying, as if they're flying this 100, 100 megapixel camera. So with that, at about at, at the altitude they fly, we get similar ground resolution to the tractors. So I think it's possible. And there are other groups that are flying um, lower res cameras, but much closer to the canopy. So I think uh, Jesse Poland's group in particular has a workflow for doing very low altitude flights to get, um, so the camera would be sort of placed probably about the same altitude as from our sprayer boom. Um. And uh, there's a question about uh, what root imaging platforms are you working with? This is from Larry York at Noble. Okay, great. Uh, so the main group doing uh, root imaging here is led by Leon Koshin. Um, 
so he came to uh, to the Global Institute for Food Security here from Cornell. And so the same sort of imaging setup they had Cornell there, they're doing here where they're doing indoor imaging um, and growing root architectures in a variety of medium and taking uh, images of that. So that's sort of the main root imaging platform. And then we have a few more experimental groups using, uh, we have a synchrotron facility here at the university. So there's some groups working on uh, various synchrotron based imaging of root structures um, in, uh, but again, in, in kind of uh, roots grown in, in pots. Okay. So um, thank you. Oh, oh, good. We have um, two more questions. So if anyone has a question, go ahead and write it in because I'm not seeing any more except for these two on the Q and A. Um, and it may be that I didn't I just didn't see it, so just copy and paste it again, please. Um, what percent overlap is expected or needed across the um, across the ground uh, and aerial platforms, like in between image frames? Yeah, that's a great question. So, it's just sort of a number of best practices that are important for getting aerial imaging data. Um, you know, in general, the overlap that's needed both along the direction of the drone and between passes of the drone is between 70 and 80 percent um, overlap in order to generate an ortho mosaic. Um, so that's sort of the best practice, but there's a, there's a sort of a number of, of steps, you know, both the overlap, the image calibration that was mentioned before, um, ensuring that the, the camera parameters in terms of sort of shutter speed um, uh, to, to reduce motion blur are important. Um, we, we actually just had a great um, UAV um, workshop uh, here that was led by the WEAT initiative um, where we had a, a number of speakers and in particular, uh, Fred, Fred Beret from INRA uh, presented some really uh, great information about sort of best practices for camera calibration um, as well as Steve Shirtliff's group here uh, presented. So I think you can find some of that information through the, the UAV subgroup of the WEAT initiative. Um, and I can, we can try to find us some links to those to pass on to Amy to provide to the group here. Okay. Yep. That sounds very good. And then I can update the webpage. I think that'd be of general interest. Um, uh, okay. Uh, let's see. I'm reading before I say something. Okay. How, Accurate could the crop height estimates be from the RGB images compared to something like LIDAR? Mm. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, and, you know, so um, when you do drone imaging in particular, uh, part of the process to construct that panorama image or that ortho mosaic image is constructing a 3D model of the topology of the canopy. And that's done from uh, a technique called structure for motion, which, you know, most people would be familiar with in the robotics community. Um, and in general, you know, the, there's been some, uh, some studies that have looked at this. I think that um, those height estimates from structure from motion can be quite accurate. I don't know if there's been an exact comparison to LIDAR based measurements, um, but certainly there's been people that have, that have compared to um, manual measurements of height in the field, like with a, with a meter stick. Um, and the advantage of the, the aerial based or the structural motion based approach is that you get a much higher sampling. You know, typically if you're measuring height with a meter stick, you're sampling a few times uh, in a yield plot, whereas you, could, you can capture the variation in height of canopy much better from uh, these uh, aerial images. Okay. Um, and let's see. Okay. We have one more question that just came up. How did the light variations uh, during the image acquisition affect the analysis? Yes, that's, um, that's an important consideration. I mean, we definitely have variable lighting conditions. Um, in, in particular, in Saskatchewan, we have lots of partly cloudy days of cumulus clouds that come. And so um, we, uh, so far we haven't been able to kind of, um, to test that directly. Um, uh, you know, we haven't had controlled days where we have a cloudy day that we can compare to partly uh, sunny days. Um, 
But in general, you know, overall cal calibration uh, with the gray panel is important. Um, and then we expect that some of these variations in lighting is probably less, less critical, um, sort of more critical because we have an overall calibration of the camera. And then um, many times with indices, um, vegetation indices, the sort of relative changes in the intensity um, kind of counteract some of the variable lighting conditions. Um, but we haven't done a really robust study of how, of how much those variable lighting conditions affect. Uh, we're, we're trying to rely on the fact that if we have uh, sufficiently large data sets that we can kind of counteract some of that variability. Okay, very good. So we've ended, um, we've ended up very much on time. Um, there's one more comment that Thank you very much for the um, for the presentation. I'd also like to thank you for the presentation and everyone who attended today. So there are a lot of questions about whether the webinar is recorded and it is recorded. And it will be available on um, YouTube. Actually, it's, it's available on YouTube now. I will edit it and then it will be available in an edited format as well. And you can go to our webpage, um, IEEE. -E -E, agra.com and there's descriptions of the webinars you can just click on the webinar you're interested in and then it'll have a link to the recording so we um, will list the mp we'll have an mp4 file that you can download or you can go to the youtube whichever one you um, prefer so uh, if you want to watch it later or send it to a colleague it'll it'll be there so uh, thanks everyone i'll go ahead and end the meeting now thanks again ian